Christ, we thank you that you gave us a new chance of being together tonight around a meal that's seeking food, spiritual one from the Old Testament. As we are discovering the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the prophets and how you sent them and guide them through the Holy Spirit and the Old Testament, that they can lead your people who went astray and bring them back to the ways of salvation, bring them back to be a nation of yours. And we ask you tonight that you show us this path of repentance that you sent through the Holy Spirit in the life of prophets and change our lives through the same Holy Spirit and fill our life with the fruits of this Holy Spirit through the intercession of the Holy Mother, Holy Siotokos, and the Holy Apostles. Amen. So welcome back. Um, we are in the same series, continuing our discussion about the uh, prophets, as we, as we said last uh, two times. Um, it's, it's not a detailed uh, discussion, it's more of an introduction. Um, we'll give just a few minutes to review what we have so far. Uh, we divided prophet uh, chronologically based on the time of whatever before Moses, uh, the early like patriarchs, and Noah and Adam. Um, then Moses definitely was a landmark in the history of the Old Testament. Then the prophets, as we understand them, early prophets and late prophets. Early prophets are those who never wrote or left a written word of prophecy like Samuel, Elijah, and Elisha. Then we have late prophets. Uh, those who we know them by in the Bible, in the in, in the Bible that we have right now, and that was known also in the uh, Hebrew Bible as uh, prophets. Um, so there are major prophets and there are minor prophets, and um, we went through more of a uh, historical, I would say, divisions. Um, the landmark again was the exile. So we divided prophets between uh, what's before the exile, what's during. Um, the exile and what's after the exile. And because we said that there are two types of exile, one for the North Kingdom uh, to Assyria and one to the South Kingdom to Babylon, we also said that there are some prophets who happen in between those two exiles. So we can have four groups actually. Um, the prophets before the exile, the greatest example is Isaiah. Then we have a, a prophet between Israel and Judea uh, exile. The greatest example is Jeremiah. Then uh, during the exile, the greatest examples are Ezekiel and Daniel. So it's easy to remember uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, then Daniel and Ezekiel are mm, during the Judean uh, or the Babylonian exile. Then late uh, after they came back from exile, the most famous uh, names that we are, are aware, all of us are aware of are definitely Zechariah and Malachi. And Haggai also because he has to do with building the walls and like renovating the the uh, the temple. So these are really late prophets. And the last one, as we said before, was Malachi. Malachi was exactly 400 uh, BC, and that was the last uh, historically speaking uh, prophet uh, that um, we had. Um, and we also refer to John the Baptist as more of a hinge between the Old Testament and New Testament. A lot of times uh, he was named a prophet. Uh, by by Jesus and even by people because people saw that he's a, uh, a prophet. Uh, then the next point that we covered was the names of the prophets. We give the name man of God, servant of God, messenger of God, Nebai and seer. Seer more of to see visions. We just we explained that um, more in details in last time. Um, we also discovered that the there is a lot of political um, things around the prophecy. Uh, there are some people who are trying to claim prophecy just by earning life, you know, trying just to satisfy the kings and send them more of a joyful message. We, make a com we made a comparison uh, between what's uh, really a prophet and what was claiming a prophet. Uh, we might also touch base today very quickly uh, in, a, in a comparison uh, between um, what is a true prophet and what is a false prophet. We might discuss that today as well. But uh, for now, that's uh, what we had, just a very, very quick review. Um, there was a very also interesting question that we answered last time. Is there such a thing as a, like a job? Someone will have a career of being a prophet. 
and um, what does it mean that there was some words that we never understood what does it mean that there is a band of prophet, a procession of prophet, a son of prophets? Uh, was there schools for prophecy? And we said that, especially in the book of Samuel, there was sometimes we read about procession of prophets. What does it mean that there is a, prof, a procession of prophets? And we said it's it's not exactly clear what does it, that mean, but most probably we're talking about uh, when it comes to sons of prophets, that those who are more of involved in prophecy, maybe they were not the prophets themselves, but they were messenger from the prophets uh, somehow. Uh, so the son of prophets might be disciples or followers to the prophet. We read a lot about the son of prophets uh, related to Elisha. So maybe Elisha was the prophet and anyone who was following him or disciple to him would be called a uh, son of prophet. Not, it doesn't have to be a physical son. Then we said oh, definitely because they live together as, as more of economic, you know, or neighborhood, uh, that's maybe that's what would they, would they say. There's also an element of praise. We read last time a lot of times uh, that they will be praising together. So there is an impression of more that might be a seminary or like a school uh, of prophecy, but definitely that's not the rule because there's a lot of people uh, who never had anything related to this atmosphere but they ended up being a prophet. And we read together someone like Amos when he had this argument on Amos 7 with Amaziah and he was saying, you know, go home, just go uh, prophesy in your land. Why are you, what are you doing here in Israel? His answer was, I was never a prophet nor a son of prophets, but the Lord took me from, the tending, from tending the flock and said to me, go prophesy to uh, Israel. So it, it looks over here, yes, there was a community of prophets, uh, but that doesn't mean that this is the rule. Um, then we answered more of a question, and I think that's where we stopped last time. How much human uh, part can the prophet put in the prophecy versus how much the God will give him as a revelation? That's that's more of a, um, you know, always there's, a, there's two sides. Uh, but the prophets, the true prophets, always were, were, were talking about how God put the words in their mouth. Read the Lord in Jeremiah. He said it clearly that God told him, I will put my words in your mouth. And a lot of time he said, I sent you my servant, the prophets, like that also in uh, Jeremiah. Um, I gave you a homework to do uh, also last time that you guys also read um, that the, the, how God called uh, some of the, the prophets. I hope, I hope you guys did uh, read this. Uh, we said there's Isaiah 6. Uh, how God appeared to Isaiah. Uh, there's Jeremiah 1 and Ezekiel 1 and 2 as well. Uh, it's a great encounter. And I think there's a lot for us to learn because these are the like few uh, incidences wh where God was just revealed and he was talking. And we said this time that there was more of a conversation. So it's not like, you know, more of a hallucination or something like someone is claiming. No, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a conversation. Like God is talking and Isaiah is answering uh, so th this conversation proves a point that it's it's a divine revelation. It's a direct revelation from God and not just like they call it heightened God consciousness. No, it's not. It's a special call to special people with special uh, messages to the point that when we talked about Belaim, he said, I must speak only what God puts in my mouth. He tried, but he couldn't. And also Amos said, the line has roared. Who would not fear? So it's I can't I can't keep it in my mouth. If God God asked me to speak, I have to speak. Um, and building on that, I want to continue also the the experiences of different prophets. Because reading Jeremiah, for example, and his reaction when God asked him to talk, he says, "If I say I will not mention him or speak anymore in his name, his word is in my heart like a fire, shut up in my bones." That's in Jeremiah twenty. I'm weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. See? So now we're continuing the idea of how much even that these prophets were forced somehow to talk. They can't just stop talking. Because as Jeremiah says, I'm weary of holding it in. I, indeed, I cannot. So in Jeremiah 20, he says, I cannot hold uh, this word. And Ezekiel actually ate the scroll, you know, he says it was bitter in my, my, my tummy. So um, there was awareness, of course, of what they're saying. 
And even if the Prophet tried to say something else, God will correct him. In case of Bal'am, he couldn't. In case of Nasan, we said the story last time, how when David asked him about building the temple, his initial reaction, yeah, whatever you have in mind, go ahead and do it, for the Lord is with you. That was Nathan's personal opinion. But the Lord appeared to him in the night and like, what are you saying? I didn't tell you uh, to say that. Uh, go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord says. And he says, no, it's not you. I will make Solomon later on build the uh, uh, temple. As if God is telling him, just don't, don't talk from your own mouth anymore. Uh, I'm telling you just to say what I'm telling you to say. Don't make up words. Um, and that shows us how much uh, God will control these uh, men and force them to say uh, what, the, what the, they have to uh, say. So, um, yes, there is definitely a personal element in it because as we will see, uh, if we try to talk about different prophets, and this is going to be very helpful when you guys read any prophet, um, the personality of the prophet affect him so much, affect what he put in the word of God. That's why we don't believe in orthodoxy and this element of dictation. You know, there's no such a thing that God is just, you know, write down what I'm telling you this way. Yes, there are words that I have to say the same, but the, the personality of the prophets always, you can see it always in the prophet. Like when you read Jeremiah, Jeremiah is very emotional, man. Like they call him, they call him the, the weeping prophet, right? So this weeping prophet, when you read about him, you can see so much how he is like very emotional and he is like, you know, um, he's like always weeping and he's like, you know, shedding tears for, for his uh, people. And that was very clear. For example, Isaiah, on the other hand, very rational man. Uh, he doesn't speak so much about himself, about his emotions. So the personality of the prophets, a lot of times you can read it uh, while you're reading the uh, prophets. Um, one more thing just to add also tonight, and I hope that the next half will be more of a spiritual, so it doesn't have to be a very dry study. Um, when you read the prophecy, uh, a lot of times you can see some crazy things going on. And I'm sorry to use this word, but it's, if you try to look at them, it's like, it's really weird. Like the way some people, some of the prophets uh, were act, sometimes when you look at him, it's just weird. Uh, one of it, for example, that God asked uh, Ezekiel to lie on, on, his, uh, on his side for days, days. And he told you know, lie on your uh, left side, uh, you know, for 390 days. So that's more than a year. So when you read that, that's, that's weird. What, what, that's in Ezekiel 4. Um, Imagine, imagine with me that a man is, is just sleeping on his, lying on his side uh, for 390 days. And when people try to interpret it, that, some people say, yes, definitely, that's a literal meaning. And Ezekiel stayed on 390 days, which is more than a year. Uh, some people say, yes, he did that, but not that the whole day will stay like that. No, he will go in the marketplace, sleep for a few minutes, on this position every day. So yes, he did slept on his side 390 days, but it's not like 390 days, day and night. No, it's just like a few minutes, maybe half an hour, something like that every day. Some people says, no, 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 no. He never did that physically. It's more of a you know, symbolic thing that he maybe he did. So there's a range of interpretation. It's hard to say exactly where we are. But I'm personally leaning toward the, the, you know, the, the thing in between. That yes, he did that physically, but not necessarily that he slept like sleep you know, day and night on this position. It's like, it's, it can happen. And, or it can, I, I really don't know. But one time also he asked him to take a clay of tablets and just lay, you know, put it before him in a laying position. And he portray on the tablets, like a clay tablet, a city just to resemble Jerusalem and put a siege against it and build a siege wall against it. And, you know, just to, sim to put a symbol of what's going to happen to Jerusalem. So he was trying to tell the people, hear what's going to happen to you. He you're going to go into exile, please repent and so on. So God here is sending a very more of illustrative uh, prophecy, not only a word, 
but sometimes what's called symbolic enactment. So there is, especially in Ezekiel, there is a big um, space, if I can say, of um, enactment in Ezekiel. One time he, he asked him to dig a, a hole in a wall and to, you know, and to carry his belonging and throw it in it to, to again, just enact what exactly is going to happen to the Israelites when exile comes and so on. If I, if I talked about Ezekiel and this symbolic enactment, I, I can't take the whole night because God was always asking him to do. Uh, we can also read about Hosea when God asked him to, uh, to get married to a harlot. And again, people have different interpretation about did he, did he really uh, get married to a harlot? Was she uh, already his wife, but she cheated on him? What is it exactly? It's hard to know. But what we can learn from all these examples that God used every single way to illustrate his message uh, with a spoken word, with enactment, with just like a style of personality. Um, how does he look like? That's um, actually different way. So it looks like God was trying uh, to send his message with every single uh, possible way. Um, next question before I start the message of prophecy, which I think the, the best uh, spiritual message in this course will be, um, is just to ask a, again a question that we addressed but very quickly is how we can know what's a true prophet and what's a po uh, false prophet. I'll just give you like kind of points that whenever you read, you can more of differentiate between a true prophet and a, and a false prophet. First off, a true prophet never claimed that he's having a word from him. He will always say God said. And he will start with his prophecy with how the God called him, how like, you know, he changed his life, how he gave him these uh, words in his mouth. We can read that definitely, I would say, in all prophets, so how they will start their prophecy by talking about their encounter with God and divine revelation and so on. Even if it's not a, it's a revelation, like um, a scene or a vision, but at least they will claim that they were in direct contact with God. And that can be seen in all the prophets. Number two, the personality of a prophet is very important. Uh, we have to see how his life looks like. Um, because all the false prophets were more of opportunists. You know, they were just trying to get money. They were trying to satisfy the king, like we said before. It's not really to hit hard on the problems uh, of this nation. Also, we said before that the false prophets never speak to the people. He also, he never, he just want to satisfy the king. So he never address people's problems. So the moral character of a prophet really make a big difference. And that's not a rule because there are some people who really act bad, like Bilaim, uh, Jonah try to escape, you know. So it's, it's, it, we cannot make it like a rule, but at least when you look at his life, his moral characters, the goal of his prophecy it would never be like his gaining or like earning money or whatever things like that. That's number two. Number three, there is all, most probably there were there will be a more of signs and wonders. We see that a lot in like Moses, Elijah, Elisha. There are a lot of signs. And actually I was just talking last, uh, when was it? It was a feast of Elisha. Um, I think it was Sunday, yeah. Uh, there was a commemoration of Elisha that when Elisha asks for the double of the spirit of Elijah, God gave him double number of miracles than Elijah. And I think they said that Elijah did eight, prophet, uh, eight miracles and Elisha did uh, 16. So it's even by number uh, that God gave him double uh, pro, uh, like miracles. So the third like kind of feature or criteria for uh, a prophet that he would do miracles or, or signs and wonders and so on. Number four, that if he said a foretelling prophecy, it has to be fulfilled. So whatever he says, uh, God will make his word fulfilled because it is said, so it can be done. Um, it, unlike all the false prophecy, definitely whatever they do, that it will never happen. And there's a great example of it, but again, you please read it yourself. It's going to take a while. It's one chapter. Uh, but I want you to read it because it's a very good example of how God will support his true prophet against the false prophet 
uh, and make his word really be fulfilled. Please write down this chapter, Jeremiah 28. I want you to read this chapter. In this chapter, there is a very interesting story of uh, Jeremiah was prophesying and Hananiah, uh, a false prophet, were trying to oppose him and say a different story. And while Jeremiah was threatening the king that an exile is coming, bad things are happening to his nation, Hananiah was looking at him like, you're lying. Everything is okay. None of these things will happen. So the nice thing about Jeremiah, he never felt offended. He answered Hananiah back and was like, amen, let it be. I don't want any bad things to happen to my people. I'm just telling you what, I, what God told me. But if you said that, everything is okay and nothing bad will happen to us there's no exile whatsoever well let it be I, amen I, I want i want i want the best for my nation but of course when you continue the chapter it ended up that god warned this hananiah that he would be killed and he, he died you know uh, just few uh, after so this is a fulfillment of a prophecy even if someone is trying to oppose it just like addressing a different that will be different so please uh, Mark Jeremiah 28 and try to read this story. It's a really interesting story for you. Um, also, the last criteria, just to make it very short, that his prophecy, any pr true prophet, has to be part of, you know, uh, and, and more of, you know, consistent with other prophecies. He will never come just to say something completely different from the other prophets. They, they, it has to follow the same line because the source, which is God, is the same. So he's not going to contradict himself. Uh, the source is the Holy Prophet. And the Holy Prophet, at the end of the day, sorry, the, whole, the Holy Spirit, at the end of the day, is just trying to fix these people's life and make them better nation and straighten their way and send them, you know, a message of, of repentance. So he's not going to contradict himself. So a, a very good criteria about it is that it's definitely matching all the other prophecy. And here come an argument. Here come a very actually valid argument. Some people say that there are prophecy that was conditional. And when this condition didn't happen, the prophecy was not fulfilled. Take an example like Jonah. Jonah warned that the, the Nineveh will be destroyed, right? And he said, okay, if you know, if you guys didn't do that, the nation, you know, if you didn't repent, the nation will be destroyed. And um, Jonah's prophecy were never fulfilled because they repented, they changed their way, and God lamented, and God was like, you know, he didn't destroy Nineveh at the end. So some people will come and say, hey, you go, there is a prophecy, and it never happened. Well, it never happened because this prophecy was a conditional prophecy, meaning that he's warning them that if they do not repent, that's what will happen. And there's a very nice verse in Jeremiah 18 that God says, if that nation I warned repents of its evil, then I will relent. So if a nation I warned repents of, it, of its evil, then I will, repent, I will relent and I will not inflict on it the disaster I had planned. So even if God has a plan of disaster, plan of destruction, he is still giving them chances. And that's a very interesting this, like, kind of argument that we can have apply that to our lives because we always have this argument of how much like you know are we just for distant to things in life or we control things how much we can control things and how much we can control destiny are we like pushed in our life way or we make this well how much can we change things and this actually argument is a great argument the fact that god is yes he is telling us repent or but this warning is not just to make us frightened no it's because he wants us to change our way and if we changed our ways he will definitely um change also uh, his his like you know warning this like you know plan of disaster or whatever so um this what's called a conditional prophecy conditional prophecy meaning that if this threatening message was uh, people relented and they changed their ways, God will definitely um, help them. 
and the clue here for any conditional prophecy that first it has to be very near like you cannot talk about something that happens hundreds of years and say that this is a conditional prophecy although this happened with the israel of nation that god promised david for example that his throne would be there forever right but when his descendant never kept the you know the this covenant they broke the covenant his throne were not um, like everlasting in a physical way although that christ was born on the throne of david in a spiritual uh, way so that's that's uh, another argument that, uh, that it's good to uh, discuss today uh, what are the criteria of the good prophet versus the false prophet and we try to discuss uh, more of what can make us feel that this is uh, a, a good prophecy um, now and i think from now on we will try to um, focus on the spiritual message in the prophecy and uh, the big title right now for us for tonight and i think we will continue that uh, next time as well maybe today we can give a summary in or, or the of the messages of the prophets then next week uh, hopefully you can finish the whole thing by digging deeper into the message of the prophets what was the message of the prophets as a big title theologically speaking the prophets were trying to speak who god is they were trying to describe god for this nation who went astray away from the law from the word of god from the covenant that they have from the promises that he built with uh with their uh, grandparents abraham isaac and jacob and moses and david and all these people so theologically speaking there is an emphasis on god's uniqueness god's power god you know sovereignty like it's uh it's a it's very strong message and the strongest one who hit hard on this um theological scene is isaiah there's a very nice verse in Isaiah 40 that Isaiah said, to whom will you compare God? To what image will you compare him? Well, nothing, right? There is no one else to compare God with. So someone like Isaiah, for example, you can put one title that he's talking about the Holy One of Israel, like God, the Holy One of Israel. And that's a theme that can be repeated also in the different prophets as if they're describing God in different words. And um, we can later on do that by summarizing, and that will be a good uh, thing that you guys write down as a note, of one feature about God in every single prophecy. Like what Isaiah, you know, how Isaiah see God. Like I said, Isaiah saw God as the Holy One of Israel. While, for example, someone like Ezekiel saw God as um, the one who is, you know, renewing his uh, covenant. Like, if you want to summarize Ezekiel with one word, actually three letters. It's a word new, N-E-W. Every single thing and prophecy in Ezekiel has to do with new, just new. It's a new temple, a new covenant, a new, uh, uh, you know, a city, a new... Uh, uh, promise and a new life and new heaven and new earth and it's everything new that's for example ezekiel in one word uh, and so on um, hopefully we can remember to give you a summary of each one of these prophets uh when it comes to the theology that they have well how do they see god and that will help us anytime we open any prophet at least we're not going to feel distracted by Sorry, um by different scenes so if you want to focus on one scene in any prophet it would be nice that you focus on it uh, from A to Z. Uh, practically speaking, prophets has three messages, three messages, and you can find them in every single uh, one of these uh, books in the prophet. And we can take them chronologically. What do I mean? Like in stages. Um, the first message is that you guys broke the covenant you israel judah then you can apply that also on us spiritually which i really care about today is we broke the covenant we had a covenant with god and we broke it 
So the first message is you better repent. You have to change your ways. In the Old Testament, the understanding of the message of repentance would just simply change lifestyle. People were worshiping idols. Okay, let's stop that. People has more of a social injustice. Let's just stop that. Uh, people were just trying to go with a rituality, more of like acting as if they're worshiping God. Let's stop that. So this covenant, this wrong way that God was trying to fix in the Old Testament was just changing you know, their lifestyle. In the New Testament, the message of repentance is not just a one-day thing. The, the repentance, as we can read in the Fathers, in the Greek word is metania, the same word that we use when we uh, like bow down and worship. And it's to change minds or to change the nose, the nose or the heart and the mind and then like this uh, heart, you can call it anything. So to metanos, metania is to change, is to transform your life. And that's not a day thing, that's a life. That's why we don't say that we repented or we just finished repentance. There's no such a thing. Repentance is not a day, uh, or it's not even a sin thing. It's a state. So it's called a state of repentance. And we can, we can call it in orthodoxy, the life of repentance. So in the Old Testament, in the prophets, and that's something, whenever you read the prophet, look for it. It's very nice that you uh, try to like underline, write down words, you know, verses that has to do with this scene of repentance you have broken the covenant you have better repent you have to change your ways you have to live a different life through spirituality through looking at things in a different way through not following the old man who always seeking himself his pleasures um he's just you know joy in anything uh, versus um and a life with a new man how to uh, oppose what the father called the passions inside us and try to live with a life of virtue. That this is a life thing. We can acquire that through prayers because at the end of the day, it's a grace. God who gave us a spirit of repentance. So we have to always keep asking for it. We have to acquire that through uh, ascetism, different forms. And now we're fasting. Uh, fasting is a, is a way of changing ways. Same way we change food, same way we change uh, minds, the same way we change behavior, the same way we change feelings and so on. So the first big theme of all the prophets is um, you have broken the covenant, you had better repent. You need to change your ways. The second level of, of the prophecy is no repentance while well, there is judgment will come on nations. Not only on you, but in all nations. So very interestingly, in most prophets, they don't only call, talk about the Israel or Judah. You will always find them talking about different nations around them. Egypt, Adum, uh, Palestine, you know, in Babylon and all these nations around them. Uh, it's very interesting that there is a theme of judgment in all the book of the, uh, of the prophets. They were all talking about a stratum uh, threatening warning message of uh, judgment if the repentance never happened. So no repentance, then there is judgment. Again, let's apply that on the Old Testament versus the New Testament theme. Old Testament judgment, again, was a physical judgment. We're talking about exile. We're talking about destruction of the temple. We're talking about losing the throne, the king's. We're talking about um, 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 disappearance of priesthood, of sacrifices, of rituals. That's the judgment. In the New Testament, there are definitely eschatological or eternal judgment at the end, you know, the last day when God will stand there and, you know, just put two types of people, those on the right, like sheep, and those on the left, like goats, as he said in, uh, in Matthew. Um, that's what's called eschatological or the eternal judgment. But there is also uh, daily uh, judgments that, you know, happens in as much as God gives uh, chances of repentance. Repentance um, also has, the, we have to 
grasp any chance of re repentance because postponing repentance eventually leads to judgment, leads that we have this uh, insensitivity. Right now, you might hear a sermon and it changed your life. Later on, you might hear a hundred sermon and you're just like, you know what? No, in the old days, I used to just like be touched with these words and sermons, whatever Abuna is saying. And right now, I'm just like, they're just talking, you know, don't worry about what they say. So you lose this, you know, spirit of repentance that maybe God was giving you this sensitivity one day. So it's very important to care about that because like we said, the second layer of the prophecy is no repentance while there, there is judgment and judgment will come not only on Christians for the, in, the, in the concept in the New Testament, the, the, the repentance, the judgment will be on all nations. Uh, how God is, you know, judging every nation, if not everyone heard the word of salvation and so on. These are questions that I'm not going to discuss here because it's beyond the level of our um, study. But again, the rule will be applied. All the nations will stand before the Lord and they will be judged. And that's a theme that we'll, we will notice if, if God gave us the life and the time to study uh, separately the prophets. Then the third layer of the prophecy is um, even that we have judgment, but there is hope. Yet there is hope beyond that judgment. There is a word that's repeated a lot in the prophets. The word is remnant, al-baqiyya, the rest. This remnant is talking about a, 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 a theme of restoration. There is a future restoration. Again, let's apply that on both testaments. In the Old Testament, even that we're talking about exile, but you will read a lot about how the prophets are talking about the hope, about the coming generation, about those who will really come back from exile to rebuild, to rebuild the temple, to rebuild the city, to rebuild the, their nation, to rebuild their life. And there is also light at the end of the tunnel, even in the Old Testament, of the coming of the Messiah as a future restoration as well as a hope for this nation that the Messiah will come. And that's definitely a very common theme in uh, Isaiah, especially the second half of Isaiah, uh, the themes of the servants. We read a lot in Isaiah, Isaiah 53, uh, 52, 54, 56, and you know, also 61, and I guess 65. There is always talking about this uh, hope about the servants who are even he is despised, even if he's dying, even if he's like carrying the you know transgressions of his people, but then he is saving his people, the savior. That's the Old Testament view. But in a New Testament view, the hope for us, for the church, is to have a new heaven, a new earth, as we read in the book of Revelation. This hope is something um, that we're expecting we're expecting first in our life but definitely eventually in heaven this hope this remnant this uh, church uh, that's not gonna be going through persecution anymore there will not be hardships anymore and on a personal level there will be no like warfare devil you know like warfare there will be no sin anymore there will be no repentance anymore. Halas, we're, we're living in the joy of this salvation without the threatening of uh, this, you know, sin and, and, and so on. So, um, so these three themes are very important uh, to study uh, when we read any prophet. The first one is the covenant. And the second one is the judgment. The third one, is the hope or the um, the remnants? So these are three uh, three um, bellers. Um, I will give a hint, maybe on the details about the first one to study the dimension of the covenant, and maybe next time we can finish the next two uh, in details. For the covenant, the covenant is. 
a theme that you can read a lot in the Old Testament, starting from Adam, following uh, Noah, then definitely Abraham. So the word um, covenant is very famous in this um, generation, but because we're studying the prophets, we have to focus on it. The word parrot or covenant was mentioned 65 uh, times. Not so much though, but the theme itself, maybe not the word itself that much, 65 comparing to all these books is a good number, but it's not like huge number comparing if we try to study other words. But um, the theme itself is very famous in, um, in the book of the prophets. And I said that before, but I think because it's fitting now here, we have to repeat it. This covenant has two dimensions, have a vertical covenant and has also a horizontal uh, aspect of it. And the prophets are always speaking about these two things, talking about the vertical covenant that God has with his nation. And that's a message of a lot of people, how God shows his nation, how they, you know, he took them, led them in the wilderness. And how he gave them this, you know, temple and how he gave them this kingship, how he gave them priesthood and how he gave them all the sacrifices, feasts and all these things and settled them down. And how this should reflect the horizontal aspect of it. And instead of the love and in this like brotherhood and in this like, you know, uh, all this like law of um, like you read six of the Ten Commandments has to do with one to one, this uh, horizontal aspect. Um, instead of that, we see a lot of materialism, uh, oppression to the poor, to the weak, uh, abusing, you know, of power. And that's something, we, unfortunately, we see a lot nowadays in our life. So it's, it's something that, of course, um, not because we're just trying to, like, you know, preach social justice, but because it's, it's important that our spiritual life, our vertical dimension of this covenant with God, as children of God, be reflecting, um, you know, on everyone else. All the prophets are talking about this corruption. Um, and I don't have time just to mention and give examples, which I have plenty of them. Um, we can read in Amos, um, you know, very harsh uh, words. Um, we can we can read in in, in 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 a lot of them and i can share just to more of have an example of um of it i will choose only one of them and I, actually i have a lot but i will choose uh what let's choose for example um uh, i would say maybe micah Micah is very touching one, Micah 3. Uh, look what he says here. Uh, he now hears is you heads of the house of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel who abhor justice and pervert all equity, who build up Zion with bloodshed and Jerusalem with in iniquity. Her heads judge for a bride, her priests teach for pay, and her prophets divine for money. Yet they lean on the Lord and say, is not the Lord among us? No harm can come upon us. See how they're cheating this vertical covenant when they cheated the horizontal one. When they lived life full of, as he described here, of sin and you know, oppression, like you know, uh, bad behavior, he, they cheated to say, oh, you know what, is not God, is not the Lord, uh, is not the Lord among us, he's here, so we don't worry about anything. Well, no, the Lord is not going to be there when you're, you know, when you're disturbing this horizontal aspect of the covenant. So this vertical covenant is related to the horizontal one, and unfortunately, they did not do that. They just ruined the whole, um, the whole idea on this um, uh, covenant that they had with uh, God. One more example, because I want you really to taste it and start to put your hands in uh, these um, prophecies is, for example, uh, Isaiah 3. Uh, in Isaiah 3.16, uh, 
look what he says here. Moreover, the Lord says, because the daughters of Zion are, not, are haughty and walk with outstretched necks and wanton eyes, walking and mincing as they go, making the jiggling with their feet, because they had these things in their feet. Look what God is, uh, is, is, is kind of threatening with it. And it's really, really hard. It says, therefore, the Lord will strike with a scab the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion. They will lose their hair, which is their bride. And the Lord will uncover their sacred parts. It's just tough language. But if you took it in a spiritual way, and I'm really, I'm really, I, I have to touch here on us because the gospel of this Sunday will be talking about how when we forgive, we'll be forgiven. So it's, it's, it's just one package. It's like you can't say, you know, forgive my sins when you're not forgiving the others. You know, you can't just claim that you're living with God. As St. John said, you cannot say that I love God when you don't love his children. It's hypocrisy. It's just like, and, and for the fathers, that's a parameter of your spirituality. If you don't talk about your covenant with God, if you don't talk about your repentance with God, if you don't talk about your spirituality with God, you cannot just spread that from, from everyone else. Even if we're claiming that people are bad or just like we're complaining about their, you know, whatever bad things they do for us. Well, yes, but that doesn't give us an excuse or, or of just, you know, misbehaving and like being cruel with other people and, 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 uh, and so on. Last one, because I still insist that I want to take you more right and left to different prophecies, because I, I want to prove that this is a theme, it's not one or two, it's a theme out there. Jeremiah says, woe to him who builds his house by unrighteousness and his chambers by injustice, who uses his neighbor's service without wages and gives him nothing for his work who says, I will build myself a white house with spacious chambers and cut out windows of it, paneling it with cedar and painting it with rebellion. Anyway, I don't want to continue. I just want to focus on this verse. Woe to him who built the house by unrighteousness and his chambers by injustice. Woe to us if we think that we're just going to fill our rooms with, you know, uh, prayers. But when we see people out there, we're not showing them this love. We're not showing this repentance. Even if we see bad things, again, I insist, how we perceive them, how we forgive their sins so we can expect forgiveness from God. That's very important in our spiritual life. We cannot separate these two separate uh, covenants. As I said, covenant has two dimensions. One of it is the vertical that God gave us, the salvation that he uh, you know, filled us with. Uh, and that has to reflect somehow on it. And when we're going to be talking next time about judgments, we will be referring also that the accusations that God had against his people has to do with, uh, definitely has to do with all these types of sins. As I said, there was distortion of the covenant, the vertical one, by worshiping idols. This is to break the vertical. And there was social injustice. That was the horizontal one. And that's what made God build his case against his people and judge them. So his case as a lawyer, as if he is presenting a case, as if he, a judge, is, you know, judging his people by these two dimensions. You worship idols, so you broke the covenant that I have with you, that there's only one God, and you broke the covenant with other people, by your brothers and sisters, by oppressing and being just, you know, uh, filling life with injustice. So this is the first pillar of the three pillars of the prophecy uh, that we um, are like kind of summarizing all the prophecy about. Um, I'll stop here and hopefully next time uh, we can finish the other two. And if there are any other additional points in this uh, discussion, we can uh, answer questions and wrap up everything. And now if you have any questions, I think it's a good time